So hello all, hope you guys are all well and having a great week. Tonight, Middlesex University Product Design, Product Design Engineering and Design Engineering are really excited to host our 17th talk in the annual guest lecture series. So this series runs weekly throughout the academic year on Thursday evenings, and we bring together a vibrant mix of speakers from across the full spectrum of design and engineering. So we have a mix of leading practitioners, opinion leaders, radical thinkers, and emerging talents to inspire and support your professional development. Tonight, we're super excited to host Lazar Jojovic, Lazar is an artist and a product designer. His undergraduate was in fine arts and painting at the Anguadante uh, University of Applied Arts in Vienna, Austria. He then studied a master's in product design at the Naba Institute in Milano in Italy. And La Lazar is a form packaging specialist at JDE, so Jacob Dowie Egbert in Utrecht and a member of the front end innovation team at JDE. So at JDE, he undertook an in internship between September 2020 and February 2021. He then had a contract extension, which he recently completed. Um, Lazar's also an award-winning designer. He won the 2020 NABA Design Management Class Competition, which was presented at Eon in Italy. He was also part of Airbender's team that won the Park Mitsubishi Design Marathon Special Prize as well in 2019. And alongside this, Lazar has also pursued a passion in the arts and sold various artworks between 2013 and 2017. So guys, over to Lazar now with a talk titled The Present and Future of Packaging Design new capabilities and context. Lazar, it's all yours. Hey, thank you so much. So thank you for hosting me. I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. And basically what I want to go through is a short overview of the current trends that I saw from my own personal experience in packaging design. It is kind of a short overview of it all. I hope we can be open later to questions and various further discussion of the topics at hand. Uh, but this is essentially meant to give you a kind of general look at the real things that are happening right now in packaging design, especially you could say with an extra focus on coffee packaging and like-minded uh, or likewise oriented uh, products. I'm just going to give uh, a quick background to me. I mean, yeah, as I said, I did have uh, a background in fine arts and design. I was originally born in Pancho, Serbia, but I moved to Holland, where I basically uh, yeah, was raised, went through the majority of, uh, of my life there, so to speak. And my most recent experience was indeed working for Jakobs Dawa Egberts, which is really the context in which a lot of this discussion will take place, because it was there that the kind of theoretical background to the multidisciplinary aspect that I learned a lot because the Italian design tradition really had a focus on that, you know, going beyond the brief, so to speak, into a rather, I have to say, a traditionally set market-oriented company like, uh, like JD. And basically there are four points of discussion that I would want to go through with everyone. Question is first, why would somebody want to go into packaging design specifically? What are the reasons that would induce an individual to go exactly in that area? Number two would be shortly to explain what are the popular themes today in packaging design? What are the main issues and hurdles specifically to one's career, especially when they start entering, you know, at an, at an entry level position? And then finally, how can you exactly surmount and thrive in the particular corporate environment that you're likely to find yourself in. So as to the first question, why go into packaging? Well, there are really kind of two main ground reasons why it is beneficial to go into packaging today as a designer. And the first one really is material oriented. Packaging is what we can call really a safe bet in terms of employment. Uh, every product that you can think of is going to need packaging. Any product, physical product that one can imagine is going to need some kind of logistical framework covering that can carry through from point A to B. And therefore, as these industries are even constantly evolving, the point is going to remain the same. I mean, an analogy that could be made is the fact that housing will remain a kind of industry on its own simply due to the fact that everyone would need a roof over their head. It's not like other products that are constantly disrupted through various innovations or are changed entirely or put out of production. Packaging, it's safe to say, is gonna be there for a long time. And then the second reason is indeed that there is a kind of focus on packaging as, as was never before. You could even say there's a political or even moral dimension to that due to the climate crisis. 
And that can be summed up in one word, sustainability. Now, I don't really want to put too much of an overemphasized point on this. There is, of course, kind of standard of greenwashing. We live in an economy where there's a fundamental contradiction between producing more and yet somehow using less. Uh, but this is definitely an area where environmental concerns play out and specifically something where one can combine the social aspect of concern, which is very much relevant in today's design, into economic practices of a business. That's definitely something that can push you to innovate as a designer. Question is, what is really in these days in terms of the trends, the kind of practices that are more and more becoming popular? Well, it is still imperative to have a technical or food science background or in design of some kind. There is, however, a major difference between the economy of yesteryear and that of today. In kind of the old capitalism of the 80s, 70s, you could say, it was a rather simple affair. You specialized in an area, you learned food science, and that is pretty much what you would do for most of the time. It might have been different in a country like Italy that has a more ad hoc tradition of design, but basically that was the standard. Um, and essentially that's different from today. What most companies or indeed many companies look forward to is a kind of hint of interdisciplinarity. That is actually how I managed to put forward my career for a very long time. Not only can you know something re relating to the brief specifically that you have to be focused on, but they would also appreciate it if you manage to expand your design capabilities into something else. If you know a bit, let's say, about uh, UI UX, if you know a little bit about graphic design, if you know something pertaining to marketing, that is something that is increasingly becoming popular. Another point to make is the future of new material technologies, especially with regard to biomaterials. Uh, kind of recycling is more and more being questioned as a kind of imperative in itself. It's really now come to the point where people want to think of new materials entirely, especially those that are based on proteins and kind of plant-based substances. It's a question whether these technologies can expand in the future, but it's definitely more and more becoming common as a point of discussion. And then finally, this is especially a very important point. When you talk about packaging, it's not only a question of what packaging is, it's the question of can it be more than packaging? And here comes the discussion of the experience economy. There's a reason why we have today more and more unboxing videos. There is a reason today why you have many people on YouTube looking at the packaging as a kind of theater in itself. It's because producers realize that they can make their customers more attracted to their product if they bring something more than the product along with it. This is something that we can discuss later in detail, but it's certainly something that is becoming more and more common. I just want to put forward one example that helps to illustrate this, and this is something I did in the early part of my internship. I want us to imagine that we have to, let's say, as a team of designers, reduce packaging for a specified product as a bundle. So it comes in two ways. We have to bundle the products together, these coffee packs, and on the other hand, we have to use less materials for it. This would have the benefit of reduced costs and maybe perhaps a rather new attractive look. And this is some of the examples that I came up with where one can think of the packaging not only as a bundle, but also being adapted to consumer choice. This is a concept I developed in my, my first internship where these coffee packs can have a perforated handle that clamps at the top and the consumer can easily take it from the shelf while also being able to split it, be, to split it apart one by one. I'm just going to quickly escape to show you a video illustration of this that we have here. And there we can see how the pack can be perforated from the handle. And then it can be separated as a part. Uh, another kind of element of that would be a simple tape covering. Another element of that would be that the packs can have a single strip that binds them together. This is especially useful for kind of soft packs where the consumer can see that the 
strapping acts as a kind of hinge which reveals a message. So you're simultaneously using the packaging as a binder while using it as a medium. This is also something that you can add a QR code, an interesting message, and other like-minded uh, advertisements. I'm using this example because it shows you that packaging is not only just a day to be seen as a kind of uh, useful communicator in and of itself, or use it as more than packaging, as we discussed before, but also that these innovations bring problems with themselves. One can say that these are very innovative ideas, or not, depending on one's point of view, but it can also mean that you have new problems that come with solutions. What if your machinery is not applicable to this kind of redesign? What if your company doesn't want to invest in new technologies that would make such bundling possible? What if the prices change with regard to certain uh, goods or materials or for the price of car goods materials? What if you would have a change in outlook that's not favorable to marketing? These are all things that have to be considered. It is therefore useful to really look at this in advance if you want to look at it in terms of design, because often what companies have problems formulating is that they have a brief that they're not able to account for in the future. That is why as a designer, you might want to think about that yourself. Always think what can come after an initial solution can be provided, even, at the, even if it comes at the culmination of a specific brief. And this leads us to discuss, okay, well, what are the exact problems that you might face with packaging? In terms of an example that you might have innovative ideas, sure, the, the, but certain sections of the company might reject that. And here's where we specifically come to the point of a major contradiction in packaging design, because it's based on two philosophies that sort of clash with one another. On the one hand, you have to reduce packaging as a concept. But on the other hand, we live in an economy where we have a perpetual increase in terms of growth. In other words, you have a contradiction between reduction and production. And this is kind of on the one hand, a real conundrum, but it can also be kind of the staging ground for very interesting innovations. However, you run up in terms of certain problems. The three main ones that I identified throughout my personal experience, and which I definitely think having talked to others are kind of widespread, is that you have firstly the question of the current status of the company's productive capacities. Whenever you have an innovation, whenever you can have a kind of new way to put forward an idea, one of the first questions you'll find out is, can we adapt it on the lines as we have? Now, this is of course very much depending on what company you work in, if you work in a startup, then clearly there's kind of more room for innovation available. But on the other hand, if you're working in a kind of more large set corporate structure, you're likely dealing with set pieces of machinery that are already there in place and which there's very little incentive to invest in in the future because people are just happy with what they already have. Therefore, you need to find a way how to adapt it often to previous lines. Not saying that's always the case, but it often will be necessary. Then we have really what is the main stumbling block in terms of the organizational structure of many companies. And that is how to please one particular section of it, and that's marketing. I cannot tell you how much in my experience in various sections of where I worked, whether it was in university collaborations with companies, whether it was in my fully independent professional career the past two years, but really, it's a question of how far you can please marketing. Even if you can satisfy 90% of the kind of goals that they would wish in a particular brief, with relatively little investment, chances are they would simply wish to reject it because of the particular input one would need. Because businesses, in terms of living in the economic model that we are in right now, they would always prefer to uh, cut costs rather than achieve kind of objectives often. This is a very economic affair. I know I speak of it in a rather cynical manner, but that is definitely something that is often the case. And it's one challenge to overcome. And there are functional concerns. And innovation can solve previous problems while creating new ones in themselves. And these would have to be foreseen, as we have discussed before. 
So these are kind of the three main dimensions of problem solving that you can often identify being a packaging specialist. And that kind of leads me to the main summary of the points I've been trying to make in, in terms of how one can adapt to starting one's career. And I wanted to look into some tips that I would like to give that have been very much based on my previous experience. I looked at five points of advice, you could say, that I think would be very applicable to students in the future, to anyone who starts working in any environment, specifically related to packaging design. And these are kind of the five things that helped me definitely throughout my career. Uh, and that got more importantly to have my contract extended. That would be point one, don't just make good work, show that it's good. I cannot tell you how presentation is key when discussing with certain stakeholders, colleagues, doesn't matter who it is. Often people, because they come from a different background or section of the company, they don't really know what it is that is an advantage in terms of a new packaging design if they do not, do not see it from that particular angle. They might only see it from a financial angle. They might only see it from the point of a factory's efficiency. So learning how to present it is key. The second point is to completely never stop talking with different people that you might come across. The real point is to have a learning experience from the very early get-go. Talking with as many people as possible is going to help saturate that particular environment because every company has a context in which your ideas, ideations may play out. The kind of idea for a new uh, sticker reduction project for a pack that you might have in one company might be totally different received in another. So that is something that you really have to get a hold of from the get-go. Then the third point will be show that you are starting with more than just 100%. 100%. Show 120%, show 130%. This is kind of a point that I made because I recently stopped, uh, I was at a time when I was finalizing my thesis, but at the same time, I really wanted to get started with my professional career. I then thought, okay, it was COVID still very much in the early parts of, uh, of 2020. I was, looking for, I was looking for employment at the time. And I thought, okay, the best way I can secure my, uh, my position very early on is to show that at the very least I'm dedicated. This is something definitely that can help impress managers and people that are directly working to you at the above level or immediate above level because it shows them that you're dedicated. It shows you, it shows them rather that you are someone who can be counted on. However, if you don't see real returns here, then it's kind of a center point to make, but then you should just leave it as it is because often it's a question of whether your work would be well received. As a general rule, however, really to try to consider to go even beyond the brief than what is expected of you in the early years or in the early few months. Then the fourth point is take the opportunity if you are not well versed in such topics for a real study of material science. Often what you have today is people coming from design backgrounds who don't know too much about food science, don't know too much about uh, the internal mechanisms of production when it comes to packaging, because especially if you come from design background as I have, you are kind of more apt to look at the production of a product in terms of its form and immediate function rather than, than how that function actually works. Many of these things will just learn by proxy over time, but it's definitely a great advantage if let's, let's say you know the function of a PET laminate early on, or if you know what would happen if you add a aluminum foil lining, what effect that would have to the longevity of aroma freshness in coffee packaging, let's say. This is something that's very much to one's advantage. And certainly I wish I would have had that when I started uh, working there. Then finally, and this is something that I really can't stress enough with regard to the earlier point I made about interdisciplinarity, know something extra. One of the reasons why I managed to really get my contract extended at a time when it was very hard to get uh, employment due to the height of COVID in Holland around that, around that time period 
was because I could fulfill other functions or other tasks that the company found useful. Not only could I work for them in terms of R&D focused work, but I could also do prototyping. I could uh, do presentational work. I could, uh, I had a background in UI UX. I was asked to design the user interface of a, of a local company website. I was asked to do graphic design pieces. I was asked to do illustrations. I was asked to do presentations. I was asked uh, to also do lead conference calls. If you can show that you are more than just what your brief demands, they will be impressed by that and consequently consider you for further positions. And then finally, finally, I just wanted to give some parting thoughts on where I think the future of factoring design is heading. And perhaps, perhaps that might be a launching pad for further questions. This is kind of what I think might happen in the next 10 or so years or beyond slightly. I think these points are to be made. I think that bioplastics will certainly be prominent in the future. If you really look at the kind of way news items are focusing on companies that are replacing wholesale plastic products with new protein-based innovations, then that is something that's more and more becoming present as production facilities come in, and especially as governments start to invest more. Then you have an arena where that will be very much ready within the next foreseeable few years. So this is very much something to look forward to in the future. We already are seeing products that are made of mycelium or protein-based packagings, if not products themselves. It's only really a matter of time to consider uh, how packaging will be plant-based in many areas. Big changes are in the next 20 years coming ahead in terms of new production technologies. And this is very much tied to automation. It's becoming increasingly more common when you look at factories in Amazon, that things are becoming more automated. This will very much, uh, this would very much affect the way in which uh, D2C consumers, direct to consumer lines are being uh, designed and so forth. So that's very much something to look forward to. In terms of direct customer experience, unboxing is something that I mentioned and related innovations are becoming very big, but especially with regard to new digital technologies, augmented reality, QR codes, digital-based tech. This is something that we see more and more today and is becoming increasingly popular. Added on to this is personalization. As I said before, it's not like the previous the times when in traditional capitalism, you would have had a focus on the following message. This is the product, this is what it does, and you should buy this because you can get it for a reduced price. People want more in, at the very least in the industrialized world where a focus is increasingly being put on personalization. New technologies like digital printing help a lot with this where personal messages can be written on an industrial scale for particular consumers. You also have subscription models that tailor to a particular way in which certain consumers act, as well as material return schemes. All these allow the consumer to become more loyal to the company, so to speak. E-commerce is very much related to this, particularly crafted experience. All of the kind of previous uh, personalized based trends are very much present in e-commerce today. Anyone who doesn't really hatch onto this will be missing a lot in terms of the next foreseeable five years. Uh, in the long run, many factors will be affected by the politics of economic models. The real question is, would not only businesses be willing to innovate, but would they see a financial incentive? And therefore, when we talk about shifts to more sustainable technologies, it is automatically a political question that is often tailored as an economic question, but still a practice remains political. One example of this, let's say, is in chemical recycling. Uh, certain companies want to try chemical recycling of, of certain plastics because that is a way in which plastics that are often combined together, composite, cannot be recycled because of the fact that you don't have mono material base. However, chemical recycling can help uh, separate these plastics in ways that were not possible before. The only problem is twofold. One, it causes own pollution problems of its own. 
And number two, governments don't have the structures or societies don't have the structures in which to often place these. So it's a big thing to look into how, especially when you have uh, supranational entities like the European Union imposing uh, new regulations, so demanding that 30% of uh, PCR become present in most products, i.e. recycled plastics, that's something that might very well change the economic landscape, a return of government intervention that sets the very stage of how businesses would act. So these are kind of the points that I discussed. I hope I didn't go or take too much time. I hope there's plenty of room for discussion. Uh, otherwise, if someone would want me to talk about something specific or feel like I missed out something, please let me know. Amazing, Lazar. Fantastic talk, a great overview of both yourself and your journey so far alongside your time at JDE. Sorry, right. what's it called there? There was a little mute there. Um, yeah, so so great insights into your, you know your your journey so far, and the present and future of packaging design. You know the different capabilities, um, both now and in the future, alongside obviously the different contexts that they could be used in. So guys, there's some fantastic questions coming through in the chat. Um, so let's let's go and visit those. Um, and feel free to continue populating the chat with questions, thoughts, comments, sentiments. The first question coming through from Kai Stockford was. Well, I don't know what. The first question coming through from Kai Stockford was, how did you find your first packaging design job? Well, that's very good. Uh, I had previous, it's kind of a hard question to answer because my first kind of real experience with packaging was in a competition that was related to finding a way how to make a packaging for a Thai company. Um, but my first, and that was kind of something that I just looked at through uh, competition views. But my first real packaging uh, job was really due to one particular platform, and that was through LinkedIn. I LinkedIn really is kind of the standard, of course, uh, platform where many people look forward to certain uh, forms of employment. But I looked, I actually, I actually initially applied not for packaging. <laughs> that's that's the reason why why this uh, conversation is kind of uh, why this question is kind of peculiar in that sense because I initially applied for Jakob Style Experts for a design job that was related to graphic design. I applied for that and then, however, they saw because their graphic design position was already filled. However, they liked other aspects of the portfolio so much that I sent that they thought, well, we would really like you to be involved in. Uh, in our packaging design R&D internship. I suspect to this day that one of the reasons why that happened was because in that portfolio, I not only showed that I you know, had a certain graphic design outlook, I showed that I, had, that I had knowledge of 3D printing, I showed that I had knowledge to prototype. Again, this point in that context can be reiterated that if you shore a variety of skills, there is a variety of options consequently available to you. Amazing. And uh, that's, that's quite an interesting point there in terms about the portfolio. You know, sometimes obviously the advice would be uh, if you're applying for a certain role and they're looking for certain you know, skill sets and you want to demonstrate that through the projects that you've undertaken so far. Um, the question to you would be like, uh, how much do you go beyond what the companies are asking for or looking for um, to, to seek to um, you know, get those particular opportunities that you've got through you know, showing a diversity and a breadth of skills? Uh, that's a very good point indeed, like, because one of the kind of counter arguments to that is, of course, you know, don't go beyond the, <laughs> beyond the line more than is necessary. Obviously, there's a kind of balancing act to be, to be maintained between sticking to the core brief. Uh, of course, certain companies, they're not going to be interested, let's say, if you have a, a, a special degree in knowing the history of porcelain. If you're applying for a company that has to do with creating a product that is totally unrelated to that, let's say. However, in terms of certain, I guess the real kind of factors that are the real kind of areas that are best to kind of additionally to additionally mention would be things relating to production in general, things relating to presentation in general. And I suppose one thing that you can also add to that 
is that you also have the ability to have knowledge about certain things that are related to the product ever so slightly as an upcoming trend. You know, for instance, like in terms of e-commerce, one of the reasons why I was so happy or so confident in talking with people is because I had previous experience in uh, programs that can make QR code digital media. And that is something that they could use on their packaging because it's something that you can apply directly. It's not a question of you know how diverse you go. Is it the question is is it useful outside the box, so to speak? I think that's a better way to look at it because that's of course a very good point that you made. You know, you don't want to go beyond uh, the pale, so to speak, and then give them the impression, okay, they're not totally focused on the brief at all. So why should we take this person? Amazing. That's a, that's a great way to frame it and a, and a great uh, response to the question as well. And another question coming in from Iram Farouk, uh, what methods or techniques would you say that the companies use to greenwash their packaging the most and something that we could look out for in the future? So if I understand the question, it is you know to identify in what ways companies basically make this facade of green sustainability, so to speak. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. So the, the real thing that it comes down to basically, first and foremost, is fact checking. Um, the kind of the kind of or what rather companies choose to omit. Uh, because really we're talking about an arena where the average consumer doesn't really have a lot of knowledge in terms of how it is actually of, of how the structure of recycling actually works. For instance, like most people don't even know how to properly recycle certain products. Uh, I think there is a statistic somewhere that over half of British consumers don't know, for instance, how to properly recycle, car, recycle corrugate uh, boards. Many people don't even know that uh, in certain cases you're supposed to flatten them. It's only recently that in the Netherlands we had specific drives to do that locally in Amsterdam, at the very least, and that was simply because the government uh, so mandated. Um, and that, that's the first thing. So it's kind of the the use of ignorance, so to speak. The second point that they do is like sort of half truths in that sense. So you can have a company that says, well, we have uh, created a new product that includes 30% PCR. Now that can very much be true. They can have a product that certainly uh, uses less, let's say less, um, uh, less uh, plastics, or they use more virgin plastics, or they use more recycled plastics. But that can be tied to a new production method that is totally not open to the public. That uh, that you know that, that that new production method might actually cause more CO two emissions in a certain LCA than was otherwise realized. Uh, I think I saw one example. I can't remember which. Trying to think of which product that was specifically, but there was a company that produced a new uh, pallet wrapping material that was made fully out of paper. And supposedly through an independent LCA, they confirmed that it had much lower CO2. Uh, but then it turned out that you had contrary opinions in an official kind of LinkedIn poll from various packaging experts. This is of course information that's not open to the, pub open to the public, so to speak. And then finally, third, there would be uh, the case that, yeah, you create uh, supposedly new solutions, uh, but those solutions themselves cause new problems. For instance, you could say that corrugate materials have a recyclability rate that's far above metals or plastics. Corrugate materials have a recyclability rate of around 80%. Uh, plastics, by contrast, have like 20, 30%, I think, even less. Uh, but try and imagine a world now when so many products were made of paper, you'd quickly exhaust all the forests on the planet at some point, right? You know, to use a rather banal example. So I think it's really those three things that companies do because they have resources of marketing. I mean, you even have certain corporations that spend something like two to three times more on marketing or more, far more on marketing, significantly more on marketing than they do on actual sustainability products. And that is, of course, a problem from a political and moral point of view. But it's also something for the designer to, to consider, really. 100%. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. And on that note, uh, what's your opinions and your thoughts around um, single-use plastics and obviously the way uh, the solutions for those, perhaps? 
Yeah, of course, that's a very big discussion that's being raised right now. I mean, it kind of was in the works for some time, of course, because people were, of course, asking, yeah, what, uh, why would you need a fork uh, to use when you can just carry it with you and so, and so forth? It's actually interesting because one of the first design projects in, in uh, the academy that I made in, in Italy was to use a retractable fork, <laughs> you know, the, a kind of packaged fork. And the concept, of course, is so simple, but the question is, we're talking about a, about a consumer environment in the industrialized world where certain habits are very hard to, to, to leave out. I mean, the real problem is when you try to frame this, I'm, now I'm getting kind of political in that sense, but the real problem here is that we're trying to frame political issues in a market context. But market is only concerned with what you can sell, right? If it were up to like a government uh, regulation or a societal decision or even designer that just wants to go in a particular way, then the answer would be simple. Yeah, just ban single-use plastics. Or in the case of, let's say, plastic forks, just ban them. No, you have to make a mandate when you go to a cafeteria, bring your own fork like with that you use all the time. And therefore, that is something that we might be increasingly pushed uh, towards. It is really that problem, the kind of consciousness of, of consumer norms that modern economic models have created. That's really kind of, the, and that can be either solved in two ways. Either you do a very firm political um, you know, decision, but that is something way beyond design, although it involves design. On the other hand, there can be a technological revolution. So, you know, let's say you have a new material that can, some mycelium based things that uh, companies or, or, or countries around the world just decide tomorrow, okay, we're just going to massively invest in this in the future because it's going to save us in the long run. Then that's also something else. But either you find, so either you find a way to ignore that consumer norm, or you find a way to supplant it with something else in the world. Think of, because it, it goes, just to make this final point, it quickly goes back to, to the issue of like that contradiction, right? On the one hand, you want to reduce. On the one hand, you want to reduce products that you're increasing production with. Think about the idea of like, one of the stupidest things ever that you can do, right? Is design packaging for a banana. <laughs> it's like, you don't need, you don't need a packaging for a banana in the sense, because that is nature's packaging, so to speak. Um, I know I'm using a rather banal example, but that kind of illustrates the point. It's not so much a design problem in itself. It is a political arena in which design can navigate in alongside other factors. Amazing. That's a re really interesting point that you raised there. So obviously one, one kind of route would be uh, the legislative model, like you mentioned, in terms of a, a political, uh, you know, a hard stance in terms of, you know, preventing the use and the implementation of you know single-use plastics um and then how much do you think obviously uh you know consumer behaviors um and uh, pl play a part in this alongside obviously uh and, and what, how do you think packaging can advance to kind of change certain attitudes and behaviors that's a very good point indeed yeah because that that kind of ties into something that I wouldn't say is an, is an in-between model, but it's something that is kind of an alternative arena, and that is consumer information, consumer enlightenment, so to speak. That is kind of an area where sort of this idea of market society is sort of politicized to some extent, because you're basically then using products to convey information. One of the ways in which this can be used as an example is in return schemes. One of the ideas that we had in, let's say, in many projects that I worked in, in e-commerce, in general, is the packaging can be used as a medium. Okay, but instead of some banal sort of advertisement gimmick, what if you really use it through, especially interactive technologies, to draw in consumers into a totally different sphere of mind that they were used to? Imagine right now that you have, let's say, packaging and uh, a D2C or e-commerce box arrive at your home, you with some technology can scan the packaging and it allows you to, I don't know, I'm just thinking here out loud, enter some VR world where they show you in more vivid language and sight than ever before kind of the effects of what the consumer does, what we do, or what the greater consuming class and like the 10% of the population of the world that really consumes a lot, you know, the jet set uh, lifestyle, so to speak. Um, what, what impact would that have 
on the consumer? That's the question. They might be induced to go into return schemes. They might think, hey, I'm looking at this kind of object that I just usually dispose of in a totally different light. Or maybe I'm going to think of uh, returning this more, or maybe I think I'm going to think of actually making the job for the recyclers easier and actually doing some separation on my own. That's really the point, isn't it? It's like, do you want to instill a certain consciousness in consumers? That's where design, I agree, can certainly uh, play a role because you're talking essentially about communication design. And the medium for that is the packaging because especially if you do it in an interesting way, which is where experience economy also comes in, you're in a way politicizing, so to speak, the consumer to do something. Now, it can depend on many other things, of course, many other factors, uh, but I would say that is certainly an issue. That can be something very effective. 100%, I totally agree, totally agree. And um, Torpidasa is asking the question, um, how would Web3 and Metaverse impact des the design of packaging? Oh boy, <laughs> that's like, yeah, of course, uh, this, this, I kind of alluded to earlier, this uh, notion of, okay, interactive technologies. I, I would say it's kind of too early to tell in that sense, because the kind of recent proclamation, as it were, by Facebook is, is something that is definitely worth food for thought, but it is kind of, we have to understand in the context in the context that Mark Zuckerberg did that proclamation because he desperately wants to reinvent Facebook because he knows that many people are not using Facebook. So we should always take it kind of as a grain of salt in terms of whether this new kind of VR sphere would would come immediately, so to speak. However, it certainly would be the case that a lot of the aspects of our lives, the kind of traditional blend between immediate reality and pseudo reality are increasingly coming down. How will that affect packaging? Well, it already is in certain regards because you know when you uh, open often many kind of high end products today, you're not really looking so much as a packaging as you're looking as a theater performance. Uh, you have QR codes on many packaging today. You have digital printing that is personalizing or customizing it. There's a company in Holland, for instance, that. Uh, was a, it's actually a company I wanted to apply to, uh, but then they cut off their internship program. It was, yeah, Jules Company. Jules Company is a company in Holland that creates uh, baby carriages. You know what they do with their packaging? They allow the packaging to be reused as toys. You, you take out the baby carriage, the packaging has like some perforations and folds, and you create it into a toy for the very kid you're buying that carriage for. So imagine now that you have this, image and okay let's say you have a product that allows this to be viewed differently in an ar space you have packaging today in wine bottles for instance where you look through the screen and it's uh, a figure pops out the question is what is the next step of all this because this is still very much handheld device based i think the next step would certainly be haptics if you have a world where let's say meta or these great platforms dominate uh, then you would certainly have the ability for, it, it's really more a question of whether packaging would just remain packaging. Because then you're, let's say in your virtual space, you have, you can either experience the packaging as if it were packaging. The packaging, however, maybe in a mixed reality has a more physical aspect. Maybe the packaging, maybe if you have a special packaging where, I don't know, somehow you feel uh, the, the coffee bean smell or you smell the aroma, these are things that are all combinatory. However, it's why to say in terms of speculation, I think it's uh, yeah also a rather political dimension to that as well, because at the end of the day, you're talking about the big domination of, uh, of, of the market. It's, yeah, it's basically similar to like the Gilded Age and already people are kind of having a politics of contradiction to that. Uh, so it's really a question of, you know, will designers, what, to what extent would designers have the freedom to innovate in an already kind of dominated sphere? That's also a question that we have to consider. Amazing. And as you touched on, you know, the jewels packaging, um, what other examples or precedents or things that you've seen in terms of packaging have really inspired you? And well, in terms of certain examples, it, it's just really a question of what you can combine with what. I mean, 
packaging, you know, I think this has to come in the context that packaging was just seen as a boring kind of element. Most people, let's be honest, they don't really think a lot about the, the packaging that they take. I mean, it's kind of a nuisance to them. Packaging is sort of like the rejected uh, top child of, of, of product design in that sense. Um, but you see that slowly changing today with unboxing videos what, and so forth. What inspired me in particular is, is packaging that has, as it inspires me with all product design, is a product that can be more than a product. Um, the jewels one inspired me because it had a social edge. It, it brought something more that is just like something to dispose of. It brings joy to the child. It might make, it might spur their imagination. Uh, I saw examples also where it had a use vis-a-vis -vis societal dimension. So for instance, I saw certain um, advice labels on packaging in terms of how to best recycle it. I think that's a you know, societal use there. It's very useful. There's also the way, because, because a product is always a product in a particular environment, it's also often a product in a particular culture. So let's say you have a, a packaging for a particular, let's say, nationally made product, or people want to know more the history of it. Well, let's say, I don't know, a wine company or a company that manufactures traditional Chinese tea or authentic Nigerian jollof rice recipes or what anything that you can think of, there can be a cultural education to that. So then there's also educative. I saw examples like that uh, very much, let's say, in certain wine products where they show the history of the winery it educates people more as well in that sense basically any examples that make a public use of information because that's an interesting contrast right it's it's a private product that the consumer buys for themselves that at the same time allows one to expand to a communal outlook it's that contrast that i think makes it interesting i like products like like that and examples that illustrate that I think they'll be very useful in the future if designers, you know, can manage to develop them. Amazing, that's super interesting. And perhaps, uh, do you have an example of uh, one packaging or one product or one thing that you've seen and you're like, wow, I wish I'd designed or worked on, on that? I'm trying to think of that right now. I mean, you know, one thing, as I mentioned before, that would definitely be the Jules uh, one, but I'm trying to think now of, uh, of another uh, particular uh arrangement i believe that uh i'm trying to think of, yeah yeah indeed there was uh there was one it was kind of a simple banal idea but uh it was one uh and this is kind of something that kind of shows the italian sort of uh design heritage so to speak that i was uh, put into but there was one kind of uh slide packaging that had like i think coffee capsules in it and when, as you opened uh, the, the sliding door, you could, a kind of figure would come out, so to speak, that symbolized sort of the use of, the, it was like this kind of snake figure. And this was kind of, it's kind of a banal thing, of course, to mention, but just something that the consumer wouldn't expect that might make them more attracted to the product as such. That is definitely something that, uh, that I would wish to, to, to emulate in my own design. I was also inspired by, by packaging that, uh, let me think as well. Yeah, there was also a, yeah, I, I was thinking about this and now just something came to mind. This was illustrated in a book by a Japanese American designer, Ken Yahara. And he was really with a design company that basically made this fruit packaging products, line of products. The funny thing is about these products, there was no branding. There was almost no like additional information. Maybe it's some part of the back that, that's required to see, of course, as, as per rules. But it was basically citrus fruits, banana fruits, uh, all done in the form of a kind of like citrus fruit layer. So the, the, the orange would have, and even the texture, if you would touch it, it would have like this citrus fruit texture. Imagine now a box, but it has the texture of a citrus fruit. Imagine a box of like uh, banana juice, but it has the texture of banana. It has like, I mean, that's just, uh, it, it's genius because they, they're using the contrast of an industrial fake, so to speak, product with a natural surface edge. And when the consumer touches that, this is why haptics is so interesting as a design concept. You, when you touch that, 
you might consider, huh, what world am I living in where, you know, I'm removed in a way from nature, from this product, but I'm yet so close to it. That might make people think about that. You know, it certainly made me think about it. He also made similar products, like he made these sandals where, it's not a packaging product now, but he made these sandals where, traditional Japanese sandals where all the surface of the sandals were like certain earth elements. So you, when you would put on the sandals, you would feel the moss on your feet or grass or some kind of uh, uh, basic earth texture or, or whatnot. I know these are kind of banal examples, but these are examples precisely that make packaging more than packaging. I think that's something very much to think about, especially in the future. Amazing. No, those, those examples are brilliant, actually. Um, so you obviously have the, the, you know, the snake that you were talking about, the element of surprise, the element of re reveal. But then you also got the tactile qualities, right? Um, which, uh, again, you connect with the product and, and you connect with those uh, earthy or, you know, fruit, citrus kind of materials. And again, it gets you thinking and, and stuff. Yeah, it's a su superb example. Um, a question coming through from Torbidas, um, what skills are crucial for daily tasks of creating packaging? It's a good question, yeah. So basically what uh, you would need is to have, first of all, a firm grip on understanding the brief because packaging design can come into a very complex procedure. Uh, it can go here and there. Focusing on what the original task was is actually one of the hardest parts. So that's something that you have to definitely keep in mind of. Uh, in terms of daily tasks, it's definitely to understand to be able to handle different components of information as meticulously as possible. Because as I explained before, in multidisciplinary aspects of what packaging, packaging design often is today, you need to know what is the price of often of, uh, of certain materials. You might have to know that. What uh, changes might there be to the factory? What are the ways in which uh, your seals and the packaging are formed on your lines? Uh, would marketing would be able to support this product? You know, you have to, to be a packaging designer, you have to be a designer often in other areas. So that's kind of the daily tasks. Other simple kind of like, I suppose, especially when you put the, the focus on the word designer here, kind of comes in two real skills that you need to have, I would argue. Uh, illustration and prototyping. Because especially if you come from an R&D context, they're more used to, okay, this material would work with that. It's like they have, they know it's the exact building blocks of what they want, but how it would exactly look, that's kind of an extra edge that will definitely be used to. That will definitely come out in much use of, uh, of your future endeavors because, you know, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, this is how we can visualize in an abstract way on paper, but to see it in front of you as a prototype, especially this will be the case for marketing. Because if you can show a real life example, hey, we made this on our line, or we just made this with our hands in, in like, Two minutes. Uh, this is something definitely that uh, that would come would be useful, you know, in terms of furthering the project itself. Because then it's seeing, it, then it's believing by seeing. And then other kind of uh, crucial skills that yeah, yeah, there's modeling, there's illustration, there's understanding of materials. Um, and then last but not least, I would say there's because you'll be often working with teams is to be able to do teamwork. And that's, that's kind of more of a design thing in general rather than packaging design, because I think, I think there, was a best, there was a real good way in which someone made the distinction between artists and designers. Artists are eye-shaped. There's only the, the interior goal of just creating, as it were. Designers are T-shaped. You need depth, but breadth as well. You know, it's not like uh, Le Corbusier where, or, or whatnot, where you just have a <laughs> distinctive reach into what you want. No, you're working in, in a wider team. And I think that's especially in terms of packaging design because the factory person or the technician might think, might have an unwelcome surprise for you saying, no, this one, this one work in a million years what you're trying. So I would definitely as a last, uh, alongside the technical knowledge, material knowledge, uh, basic prototyping skills very much. I mean, I have to say often in certain companies that's even kind of lacking and can be a huge advantage, but last but not least teamwork. So yeah, those four things I would mainly name in a broad general sense. Amazing, amazing. And James Buhan's asking a question um, in terms of uh, bubble wrap. So bubble wrap's used around the world to protect packaging and objects in packages. And it's not obviously eco as eco-friendly as it ends up in our seas and so forth. 
So do you see an eco alternative to this become red, becoming readily available and replacing um, the traditional bubble wrap in, within the next five years or so? I think I would, yeah, because in the long term, yes, considering that when you look at the properties of, of material like bubble wrap or a product concept like bubble wrap, okay, the concept is basically to write a kind of cushioning or softening. This is especially the case in e-commerce because when you look at as supply lines become ever more dynamic, increasing, you're going to have boxes move willy-nilly everywhere that you can imagine. So that's obviously going to cause a lot of issues. One of the areas in e-commerce, for instance, that you most often have to deal with is not even with design. It's whether your nice products that you might uh, make would even come out alive at the end of it all, because anything can happen. Therefore, protecting the product often is central there. So in terms of that central focus of bubble wrap, yeah, that can be very much uh, re replaced. I mean, in the long term. It's more a question whether the productive capacities and arrangements for that can be maintained. Because let's look at some of the alternatives to that. Okay, so there's there's corrugates, yeah, uh, but that might, uh, let's say, in certain areas, cost more. Although I guess recycled ones are more cheaper. You might have alternative fillings uh, based on paper materials. We're seeing that increasingly. In fact, I've seen that in the professional sphere as well. On my own, uh, from my own personal experience, uh, then there's like bio-based materials. So, as I said before, you have a, let's say a a product like that is mycelium-based or protein-based or starch-based, and you can easily replace that with the plastic uh, at hand. I guess another alternative would be like okay, the bubble wrap can be sort of used as a return deposit. But then you're thinking about recycling a product whose, whose production has already caused a certain effect on the environment, right? So in a wider sustainability context, that would be, of course, the best to just you know do away with it, replace it. I definitely think it's possible because I've seen it in my own uh, personal experience. The question is rather, will businesses or even societies at large uh, have the political will just to implement that because those technologies are still in their infancy it's you can order it tomorrow but the problem is simply that uh, a the factory doesn't have the production capacity for that and b uh, the price is still in many areas not uh, not uh, good enough 100 percent, yeah like the, the the solution is is, is not always there right at, at the moment um another great example actually what's it called that came to mind as lazar was speaking was um, the packaging material under the brand Plumo. Um, so it's a, a feather-based, um, a waste waste feather from poultry, et cetera, um, which has been obviously transformed into like an insulation material, which is used for primarily for um, chilled and frozen food deliveries and was developed at um, Imperial College London. Um, so it's, it's an interesting one, an interesting context of use. Um, obviously you get other alternatives, like, you know, for example, uh, the in talk, talking about the bubble wrap, um, it's used a lot in packaging in terms of like jiffy bags, et cetera. Then you have the, the, the alternative, like shredded paper, et cetera, fibers and stuff, which, uh, I mean, you know, provide a certain, um, you know, a green kind of solution, but also a very messy one if you, uh, what's it called, uh, don't handle it in the same way as, uh, you know, um, as, as bubble wrap. And bubble wrapper, uh, you know, for example, an, a green solution to that is, is a really interesting concept. Um, so what's it called? Uh, we'll keep an eye on that one, James. Another question coming through from Top what, what do you think about screens and electronics in, integrated within packaging? And what sense like that you that uh, you use the screen or screen based technologies in order to interact with this packaging specifically, right? Or in that sense? Yeah, I guess uh, that there's both angles to that, right? So um, in the sense of, uh, you know, what you mentioned before, like markers, like QR codes, etc, where you kind of interface um, via the packaging. Or alternatively, maybe um, electronics integrated within the actual packaging as well. Okay, the first one definitely that's that's already something that you that you see. Uh, AR, especially in the standard handheld device setting, that's you know very much common there. It's more the question of what experience specifically you bring there. In terms of integrating it already with within the within the packaging itself, kind of the way where I see that somewhat occurring is with flexible screen technology especially as that becomes more cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, another area that I kind of see that happening as well is with, uh, and this is kind of just futuristic thinking on my part, but it's, it's when I 
because I was also involved in a lot of projects relating to AR, augmented reality, mixed reality. In fact, my thesis was on that specifically. And it's really amazing how many phones you have, for instance, today that can have projection, uh, projection tech built within them. Imagine now you have a product where you just project onto the packaging and it comes up with an animation of some kind, totally changes it. Maybe in the future, when you look at the home, that's another way to think about it, not personal devices, but the home as such can be a kind of interactive spot where the lighting can project sort of something on, on the packaging and such. Really in terms of the screen being built into the packaging, more or less, I can, that's something that's somewhat harder for me to imagine. The only way yeah, that I can really think of that is with flexible uh, tech or especially when you have haptic uh, technologies that are built in with lighting technologies. Because then you can imagine, let's say, uh, a figure popping out of the popping out of the packaging. The real question, the real challenge there for for businesses would be twofold, right? It's it's a that would you know cause another sustainability question in itself, and b the costs that are involved. The one area where I definitely would see that in is with electronical products themselves that can be kind of integrated with the product that they're transporting already. And number two would be just high end projects products in general, where, you know, the consumer profit in terms of how much the customer will pay, you know, would be, would so guarantee a profit that uh, they can just do something like that. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Lazon, I think that brings us to the end. Uh, a fantastic talk, really thought provoking, great Q and A as well. So th thanks a lot for your time and talk details of the, of Lazar and, and, this, and, this, and the details of the talk as well were sent to your emails ahead of the talk. So definitely feel free to connect and browse. And to all the participants and attendees who joined us tonight, staff, students, alumni, we really look forward to seeing you all again next week. So keep an eye out on your emails for the details of the next speaker and talk as well. So until next week, guys, stay well, stay safe, and thank you guys. Thank you so much, Ahmed. It was really great. Thank you for inviting me.